Hello, everyone. Yay, hi, hi, hey. Um, so happy to see you all. Thank you all so much for coming. Um, thank you to our artists and readers for being here to share with us tonight. Thank you to the Poetry Project. Um, I'm very grateful to be here. I'm just gonna pull up some notes. Sorry, they're on my phone. Okay. Um, so, um, before we get going tonight, I just wanna take a second to um, reckon with the colonial dispossessions, expropriations, and contestations that form the ground of this land and architecture. So let's take some time to listen to this space together, think about here, who is here, who is not here, who has been here, who has not been here, who will be and who will not be here. Thank you. So um, my name is Ethan Philbrick. I'm really honored to get to help the Poetry Project curate some programming this year. Um, and I am so happy to be um, welcoming you here tonight. Little logistics, we have exits here, here, bathrooms upstairs, also another more accessible bathroom um, out this door. You can ask anybody about getting to any of those places. Um, so while working in diverging forms, modes, and genres, choreography, writing, theory, Jonathan Gonzalez and Alex Wahelia occupy a shared terrain of study as a feeling out and through the black techno poetics of movement and sound with a shared close attention to an extension of black feminist critical accounts of the imperialist epistemological circuitry of Western civilization and the urgent need to think, feel, and practice beyond inherited conceptualizations of the human. Tonight, Gonzalez and Wahelia will offer oscillating presentations alongside a simultaneous movement investigation by Marguerite Hemings, and I invite you to visit the Poetry Project website for full bios and read all of that to read. Um, just a little announcement, tonight is also an anticipatory celebration of the um, soon publication of um, Professor Wahelia's forthcoming book, Fenin. We have copies here. This is its first public appearance, so get them, you know, like it's also like a book leaking event, you know? Um, so, you know, as, as this, you know, devolves into a more informal hang, please come visit and grab a book. And, um, and also speaking of sort of the end of tonight, um, towards the end of this evening's offerings, which will be about 60 minutes, um, we'll open it out into a conversation. So if throughout the presentation you have thoughts of your own, take note of them, stay with them, and at the end there will be some time to be able to talk together. Um, so without further ado, please welcome Jonathan Gonzalez and Alex Wahelia. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, hello. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay. Um, I guess I'll give some context. We're going to do seven minutes each, rotating across um, our offerings. Marguerite is here with us also in response, um, primarily to my offerings. But um, as we are going, the oscillations will shift. So um, is that it? One, uneasiness wills its way around my swollen tongue. The extract I make my language out of so I might speak to you as frequency, as the music in the history of escape. Anamnesis, anamnesis, fahima ife. 
R and I are on vacation traveling across the southern coast of France. It's our first time, so we rent a car and plan a few stops to catch our breath along the way. We've cobbled together an itinerary from three travel guides R stole from his university bookstore. Our Google spreadsheet has an assortment of choose your own adventures organized by nature, art, food, drinks, bookstores, live music, and random. We arrive in Marseille, drive along the Mediterranean east, stopping at the public beach in Cannes to watch the kite surfers swimming and bathing the daylight hours away in Nice, eating by cliffside near Monaco, driving up the treacherous roads of the Alps and down into the valleys of Provence. The trip is held together by a goal to follow the lavender fields. One of our guidebooks offers us a route best traveled in July. The map attaches what looks like a constellation of rural highways together in a path from southeast coast to northwest interior down towards the southwest over three weeks. Every day the sun and humidity mix to hit a fever pitch around 3 p.m. The overwhelming heat sucks the energy right out of us while the whole of the village retreats indoors until dinner. M, the manager of the bed and breakfast in Provence shares that the heat waves have gotten worse since the last few years. The local rapids are mere streams. The gorge has receded and the reservoir is low. M says it has also affected the growing season. Most of the crops in the region are appearing earlier than expected. She looks out over the nearest farm down the hill. Better hurry up. You're just in time for the harvest. She is pointing towards a truck parked in the middle of the field. To its left, dozens of rows of lavender have been cleared as we capture the remains in scent. Two. December 26, 2020, Chicago, Illinois. The second wave, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Of high number of coronavirus infections, resultant hospitalizations and deaths has overtaken most of the United States as well as many other parts of the globe. It also happens to be the day after the release of SZA's Good Days, which I play on a continuous loop, streaming it on repeat without realizing until later that I'm already on my 10th listen of the day. Over the next few months, I will engage this song a few hundred more times. There was something different about SZA's um, then latest release with its soothingly forging and baroque sounding acoustic guitar loop, tender yet persistent drums, sampled seagull noises, and intermittently undecipherable lyrics due to SZA's unique delivery. And the extended outro with the following reiterated mantra, always in my mind, always in my mind, mind. These lines, succinctly encapsulated in the form of a gorgeous four minute and 39 second R&B song, the preceding nine months during which life took place for many almost exclusively in their minds and on their screens, that is, if life occurred at all. All these factors amalgamate into something akin to a vibe that might best be described as melancholic jubilance or euphoric melancholy. When combined with those parts of the song's words that are readily discernible and that address interiority, being in one's minds, the potential dangers of the outside, the end of the world, and particularly the repeated invocation of I be on my empty mind shit, they combine to form a pandemic anthem, a hymn that is not too thoughtlessly celebratory but wistfully insists on good days both in the songs now and in the hope for a post-pandemic future. In this scenario, as in the real world, the pandemic will most likely not end any not anytime soon, but many people's lives, both that did and those that did not die, will have been incontrovertibly altered regardless. As intimate as it is capacious in lyrical content, sung intonation, and sonic architecture, Good Days is very of its, of this, of our moment, unambiguously from and of the now, while at the same time, um, amplifying the extensive history of R&B music's deft fusion of the personal and the political. 
In this way, SZA's lyrics pertain to a romantic relationship gone awry as much as they tackle through interior monologue the broader dimensions of life during the COVID-19 pandemic. In fact, the inarticulacy of the parts of the Good Day's lyrics, which results from SZA's unique style of vocalization that has been dubbed by some disparagingly as singing in italics, constitutes a part of what makes this song so special and able to give expression to the complicated life situation defined by the COVID pandemic where death is even more lurkingly ever present than it is in a normal, quote unquote, cis um, heteropatriarchal anti-black world. Good Day sounds newly emergent forms of heartbreak without forgetting the pre-existing conditions that got us here. It carries forth the tradition of R&B music speaking obliquely in hushed tones to the politics of its age. For instance, um, Aretha Franklin demanding um, our, um, um, R-E-S-P-E-C-T, and um, or Sam Cooke imparting that a change is going to come, while also conjuring the non-wordness of sound. SZA's singing style takes on this extra-linguistic dimension because she frequently enunciates words that are extremely counterintuitive to how they would be pronounced in everyday English language speech, either in standard or colloquial Id idioms and as a result exquisitely boosts their sonic materialities and aesthetic virtualities to realms beyond linguistic meaning. Though queer content in R&B has existed for years, queer listeners are often still compelled to engage with the, the genre through the frequential wavelengths of what Trevor Ellison calls a black femme praxis, defined, and I'm quoting, as a lived politics of double crossing or, um, or making queer use of racialized and gender labor constructs and heteronormative nuclear family relations, end quote. R&B lends itself to making queer use of um, because of its emphasis on the effective and domestic and interpersonal, mostly heterosexual normative relations. SZA, along with Frank Ocean, has been instrumental in introducing new vocal and thematic languages into R&B music, as well as everyday observational styles of singing that move away from the um, church-derived melismatic dramatics that once defined the genre to embrace more introverted, restrained, observational, and conversational topics and modes of singing. The constitutive opacity of SZA's lyrics, sung delivery and overall sound, um, of the instrumentation make Good Days perfect for conjuring the meeting point of low-level claustrophobic anxiety and the reticent pleasure precipitated by the realities of the um, of a COVID and post-COVID world. Um, <clears throat> The critique of vibe singing and RB's increasing disassociation from black churches as spaces of musical apprenticeship has for some positioned post-1970s R&B music as inauthentically black. Um, though the genre has surely undergone some fundamental shifts during this time, it remains the foundation for most other forms of um, popular music, ranging from Afrobeats to country and hip hop. Um, and um, its discrediting is clearly due to the genre's perceived femininity, beginning with the disco era and continuing to the, um, um, with the ascendancy of hip hop. Thus, while surely charting new territories within the genre, SZA's and Frank Ocean's oeuvres remain unmistakably black and unambiguously R&B, very much bearing witness to and fabulating with black life, theirs and ours. As a genre with complex aesthetic and political parameters, as well as historical lineages and archival sedimentations, contemporary R&B sonically chronicles and theorizes the beautiful and communicative fluctuating contours, black interior life, interpersonal relationships, and erotics take on under the protracted genocidal conditions of neoliberal racial capitalism. M's smile is wide and always around the corner as I walk the halls. The creases of her mouth almost reach from ear to ear, though her eyes seem ambivalent to the rest of the invitation on her face. R thinks M is tricky too. He blames it on the wine being too powerful. Something about the sediments bringing out the Dionysian in people. R is determined to sneak into the farm down the hill before the harvesters finish the final plot in the morning. We sneak in at sunset. R slides down the steep hill from the roadside onto the farmer's property. He does this with his camera and a bag of lenses. I sit on the gravel road and watch the cleared plots as R takes photos of the remaining lavender bulbs. He changes lenses and focus, shifting the grain effect, playing with aperture, angling the retina towards what's left of the sun. 
The pitch black of night is inching over the lowlands. Rays of burnt orange shoot up over the valley from behind a ridge. The overwhelming heat only eases off slightly through the night. So we give in to M's suggestion and leave the slated windows ajar. The valley is loud with all kinds of life. There are familiar screeches and buzzes of insects, but there are also squawks and snarls and the bristle of tall grass being flattened, describing a traveling world unknown to us that pours in as we sleep. We meet F the next day at breakfast. It's M's B&B, &B, but F has been around since they got together some years back. We learn this when F takes us for a hike. He mentions biking from Norway to Barcelona, which we respond with amazement. It's clear three hours into the Nordic style hike with no established end time that F is outdoorsy and prides himself on it. We come upon a wild lavender field hidden within a summit. It looks completely untouched. F explains to us the difference between the mass produced crop for distilling factories and wild lavender fields maintained by residents for personal use. Looking out from this elevation, it becomes easier to spot the difference in the valley. There are the wild lavender groves appearing like patchwork preserved behind the remaining dense tree line, and then there is the monotony of production fields turned dry, brown plumes of stalk bursting from the ground in each direction, exposing the plains, exposing the plains to harden in the sun on either side of the main road. When June Jordan arrives in Mykonos to fulfill her fellowship, <coughs> when June Jordan arrives in Mykonos to fulfill her fellowship offered by the Rome Prize, all she could think about was Mississippi. How is it, she writes, that this island of Mykonos, which is pretty much, quote, just a rock, is able to sustain these residents with a plethora of nutritious foods, while the fertile soils of Mississippi, where nearly anything could grow, are plagued with hunger counties? populated by black people with centuries of growing knowledge. Unable to find an answer to that question while riding in Mykonos, June Jordan rescinds the Rome Prize and flies back to Mississippi to figure it out. I am sent back to G's farm in Trinidad in my mind. I was with A and M when we visited the farm that G and H maintain on the outskirts of Port of Spain. Their renegade farm cultivates cacao for sale, among other seasonal crop they take home for food. G tells us that though cacao is native to the soil, a trade agreement with Venezuela in exchange for Trinidadian petrol prohibits the local growing and manufacturing of the crop. G says that cacao embargo is an issue across the diaspora. In response, she has formed a farmer's alliance with growers from Cote d'Ivoire, Equatorial Guinea, Cape Verde, and Ghana. They exchange growing methods and strategize policy reform. G and H grow cacao and produce chocolate sweeteners, and dyes for sale under a Venezuelan alias. The farm is a steep climb up a hill by foot, a quarter of a mile or so, after a 40-minute dr drive through a jungle-side hill path, which is only recognizable by the few who know how to read these lands. Like the wild lavender groves, the farm sits on a summit atop one of the highest elevations. There are winding tomatillos, wrapping mangrove bark, Shady tobacco leaves looming from rubber trees, trenches of squash and bitter lemon, and stalks of cacao. I tell G that you would never recognize what they're up to as a farm at all. G says, that's the point. While there's certainly no necessity to shout, it sure feels good when they scream your name like a protest, sending tremors of pleasure and shudders of anxiety down the spine and course because intimate life unfolds in the street, transforming eros into communal luxury. No need to scream, only to listen, permitting everything she felt to pour out, the aspiration, the love, the girl broken into, the grief. Everywhere but here is complicated. Can you say my name? Say my name, say my name. Can you say her name? Can you say their name? What is the form adequate to conveying the story of these unknown and anonymous radicals? Can you make out the hope, the sorrow, and the care in the non-existent maternal ballad, Dona Bana Koba Gene Gene Me? Like a protest, Saidia Hartman's narratives exceed the words, the verses. Knowing as little as our mothers what its words might signify, but grasping very well how all the things secreted and harbored deep inside are felt and exclaimed. What if 
all the things, all the things, damn. I am left with one word, Corrine, entranced and tickled by all the things it is, all the things it could be, just all the things, especially its analogous existence to the function of background vocals as multiplicatory harmonic beds for the lead vocals in R&B music. I shudder in delight at its meaning and how Hartman weaves it throughout wayward lives, engendering the Corrine as method, all the things. The words so fittingly describe Hartman's transcendal chorinal modalities of thinking, writing, and envisaging throughout this text in which she slowly recoils from the great man or tragic hero in favor of a universe in which untranslatable songs and seeming nonsense make good uh, um, the promise of revolution. Don't you know? They're talking about a revolution. It sounds like a whisper, don't you know? Take Hartman's restaging of W.E.B. Du Bois' sociological work from the turn of the 20th century, especially um, the 1899 Philadelphia Negro, which required him to take up residence in the city's seventh ward for a year. Rather than simply dismissing, uh, dismissing Du Bois' deep Victorio-patriarchal disquiets about the supposed sensual immorality and criminality of young black women, Hartman remixes Willie D. And Willie is the name that Du Bois' mother called him, in a Quranic style, taking his authoritatively Prussian lead vocals, filtering them through circles and layers of echo and delay, while also setting them atop the bass line so thunderously deep as to be deemed indelicate, if not altogether vulgar, and adding a plethora of harmonic vocal tracks, inaudible in Du Bois' original mix, to amplify <coughs> excuse me, the drama hiding behind the statistics and skewed gender ratios. The overlapping sheets of vocal harmonies in Hartman's, um, Hartman's coronal mix ring out an open enclosure at the tumultuous crossroads of the girl and the Negro problem. And if you're skilled of eavesdropping, you might hear the vertiginous sounds of the words riot, rush, tremble, fight, strike, being uttered ASMR style by the folks on the corner of 7th and Lombard, whether they're coming from their place of employment, on their way to their job, or simply working the street. After all, everybody in the beautiful anarchy of the street symphony is on the way to some place better than this. Was the choir rehearsing in the basement that, um, on, of that building down the block on Lombard singing, lover boy, come on and take me, only um, you know how to make me shudder with anticipation? Or were they reciting, were you there when they crucified my lord? Or sometimes it causes me to tremble. I can't quite tell. Does it matter what or who causes you to tremble or shudder, where and how you find wayward paths to the vulgar pleasures of glitter and shine? So long as they're harbingers of wild hope and the gift of chance. Willie Du Bois, now the enfleshed Corrine, shudders in disgust and shame, but also trembles with the palpably anticipatory pleasure of experiencing only everything that he feared. Would dear Du Bois ever come to the realization that experiments with conjugality and the flexible elastic modalities of kinship were not a plantation holdover, but resources of black survival? Maybe William Edward Burkhardt shudders just a tiny bit, maybe he trembles violently. We don't know. What we can say with certainty after reading Hartman's Wayward Lives is that back on the corner of Lombard and Seventh, as a retort to Du Bois' social scientific but still somewhat reckless eyeballing, the two young women locked arms, turned away, and continued their stroll. They resumed to delight in rumor and created scandal by embellishing the queer parlor drama of He Said and She Said until the truth was no longer possible to discern. Remember when you said she got the papers, but I've got the man? And later, when, I saw, um, when you saw them holding hands on Market Street, it turned out that another man was loving yours too, and his too much sugar in the tank behind then had the nerve to say another man is twice as nice? Well, do I have some news for you, girl? You, me, and he, what we gonna do, baby? You, me, and he, what we gonna do, baby? What if blackness referred to rare and obsolete definitions of matter, a substance without form? Denise Ferreira da Silva. An expose on Ansem Kiefer's occupation series circulates on what is then known as Twitter. I shared the article with R. We talk, uh, we talk for days about it on different terms, about the act of re-performance, about the workings of the photograph, about the photograph as a document, 
about the camera as a witness, about memory as temporal rebound. R goes down an internet algorithm hole and finds something called the Eskaton Foundation, which will be hosting public tours of Kiefer's studio, La Ribeau. We managed to purchase two tickets and add the stop in Barjac to our itinerary. La Ribeau's sheer size and topography emerge like a mirage within the village landscape of Barjac. Kiefer's towering sculptural works of industrial concrete and lead are housed outdoors and in repurposed greenhouses and massive hangar-sized storage facilities. The works and their containers creep out from the estate's barbed wire fencing as we drive up the country road. Our tour group seems to be made up of diehard Kiefer fans. The general giddy fanfare strikes me a bit absent-minded, given the content of the work, so R and I get some distance to look and listen on our own. We walk through a collection of large and white, large and small white cubes when our tour guide L ushers us down a flight of stairs into a subterranean level that has been dug out and terraformed. The smell of earth and the sight of non-rectilinearity feels like we've entered a different geological period within Kiefer's Ouv. We take a step further into the cave to find a solitary room around the bend of earth and wall. The room is an installation, Women of the Revolution, that appears like a theatrical scene with 20 bed frames made of lead covered in lead bed sheets that impress a palpable weight. The container's fabricated walls display a script of tape with handwritten names corresponding to each bed. Kiefer appears in a large black and white self-portrait printed on lead hanging in the upstage center, back facing gazing out onto a beach scene, the only human subject in the setting. The image recalls a younger Kiefer performing the Nazi hail in Besetzungen. Yet this time, the back-facing motif of Ruck and Figur is employed in a canonical register of German romanticist ideals of the sublime. R and I whisper about how this photograph bears a strong resemblance to Caspar David Friedrich's Wanderer Above the Sea and Fog. Elle invites us to walk through the installation. I come close to one of the bed frames to find a shallow pool of water in a smooth indentation. The scene is an intimate dialogue between water, lead, and the airborne residue of the surround. A dialogue which has begun well before our arrival and will continue after we have left. Elle shares that the installation's title is from an 1854 study by Jules Michelet. Michelet's Le Femme de la Révolution chronicles the lives of women who were political dissidents, significant to the French Revolution, unaccounted for in the archive. The beds, L says, represent these women. It is an offering made by Kiefer, an act of repair, to bring them into common discourse. The tour group falls silent for the first time in a unison choreography of looking down at the pools of water. The intranslatable frequencies of communications occurring between things, in this underground elevation, animate a lapse, a lapse within the punctuation of Elle's work as a tour guide to offer transparency to all parts through description. The lapse is a haunt, a haunting frequency that punctuates what cannot be resolved by becoming named, what will not be given form. In November of 2020, the Fuck University of California graduate student COLA movement invite Tiffany Lathabo King to present a lecture entitled Beyond Work, Black and Indigenous Femis Feminist Critiques of Work as Being. King's thesis analyzes black and indigenous radical feminisms on variables of entanglement, non-sovereignty, and futurity and places these pillars in ideological tension with Marx's 1844 economic and philosophical manuscripts to think with cosmologies beyond work. In the 1844 manuscripts, Marx theorizes the formation of the proletariat or the subject being as actualized through his, quote, duplication of his subject status in the production of an objective world. His production of the objective world illustrates the passivity of the land and other forms of non-human life with black and indigenous life made thing and savage in its wake. As Marx states, it is just in his work upon the objective world, therefore, that man really proves himself to be a species being. This production is his active species life. Through his production, nature appears as his work and his reality. 
he duplicates himself, not only as in consciousness intellectually, but also actively in reality, and therefore he sees himself in a world he has created. That in order to actualize a project beyond the human that will permit a more livable frequency, perhaps a frequency that can be with the terrain of things, a frequency that is not hostile but convenes with black and indigenous grammars, we would have to look elsewhere than unalienated labor, property, and individuated life as method. Things that dwell on the horizontal plane, reproductive labor, blackness, indigeneity, are what Keeper's back-facing figure cannot see. To desire to recover for the purpose of addition into the plagued archive is a murderous act of invitation with synonyms like diversity, equity, and inclusion. To seek to be the one, the property, as in the bodied, to claim one another's as matter, as their individu individuated form, to be identified. Nathaniel Mackey's Mu 122nd part, all accruing to the one, helps us here when he says, again, we came to speak of the one, an idea whose time had gone and come back on a balcony overlooking the hill west. The sun we turned away from, squinting, I'd have said, we might as well stare at the sun. But she cooked and cooled it, not letting people rest. All she said accrues to the one, no way out. Between 2001 and 2011, smartphones had not only thoroughly suffused the lyrical and sonic universes of hip hop and R&B, but of course also become mainstays in many quotidian landscapes around the globe. Um, this is when I considered um, these questions in order to chart how mobile communication devices became to be at the center of um, R&B music. Um, just a few years later, by 2015, in the wake of the immense success of um, Drake's Hotline Bling, Erica Badu created a complete mixtape replete with 11 songs that are either cover versions <coughs> or contain significant samples of R&B songs about telecommunications by such artists as New Edition, the Isley Brothers, Usher, Uncle Jam's, um, and, and Uncle Jam's Army. Though Badu does not include them in, their, um, in her history lesson, there also exists an elaborate archive of black femme R&B performers singing about telephones. For instance, Aretha Franklin with um, Call Me or Stephanie Mills' version of Prince's How Come You Don't Call Me Anymore. Badu gives us a history lesson in the form of sonic pageantry that accents the now, since the mixed hip as a whole serves to contextualize and respond to Drake's crooning about missed telephonic interaction, i.e. why we instantly knew that it can only mean one thing if that, um, if that hotline blink. Uh, nevertheless, after several years have passed, I'm still not sure I understand why Drake deems wearing less and going out more as undesirable. Um, I was reminded again of how centrally telephones and mobile devices still feature in many R&B and hip hop releases on a sunny day in the spring of 2021. Through open windows of my apartment, I could hear a car on the street blasting a song I didn't immediately recognize. Because it was catchy, I summoned the Shazam app on my phone to reveal its identity. Even though this app is a marvel of modern technology, it's one of the only apps that actually does exactly what it's supposed to do <laughs> and does it consistently. Um, Shazam, of course, sometimes fails when confronted with distance and distorted bass heavy and moving car speakers. Fortunately, in this case, the trusty sonic detection software did not disappoint. And once the app had concluded its digital alchemy, I went to scream the track and could not get past the following line from what turned out to be Polo G's rap star. The only B-I-C-T-H I give conversation to is Siri. <laughs> how does such a statement, um, I mean, it's a hilarious statement, granted, but also how does such a statement become possible and intelligible in a number one hit on the Billboard charts in 2021? Of course, we know that Siri is an artificially intelligent voice, um, 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 voice activated assistant that has been an integral part of iPhones for the last 10 years. Until 2021, the US version of the software had a default white female voice, immediately recognizable to many people. Amazon's Alexa, Google's Assistant, and Microsoft's Cortana deploy similar voices. Even though the idea of Siri as feminine has been part and parcel of the virtual assistant's cultural footprint since its initial popularization. The effective um, um, personification of Siri in this particular fashion depends on just how deeply mo mobile communication devices have become 
intertwined with the stuff of everyday life, communication and interpersonal relationships in the Western world and beyond. Um, alternately, take little TJs and six slack or black, depending on um, who you ask, um, track I'm Calling My Phone, another big hit from the spring of 2021, in which the performers melancholically bemoan a former lover continuing to contact them long after the romantic or sexual relationship has ended. The song's post-chorus, discernibly distinct from the other two rapping and singing voices on the track associated with Lil TJ and um, Black, consists of a sped up and pitched up vocal sample on a loop chanting, can't get you off my mind now, and seemingly conjures the persistent female counterpart who keeps calling the two male performers' phones. Even though the incantation of can't take you off my mind now is an integral part of the song, to me, um, it's the most memorable part of the um, 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 track, even more so than the actual chorus. Who this voice belongs to is not divulged in the song, in the music video, or even in the song credits on streaming services. Um, however, according to several internet chat rooms, the loop is based on a sample from the software plugin Arcade, um, plugin Arcade produced by the output company. So it's a sample of a software plugin. Um, in addition, despite featuring women dancers and actors in the music video, the camera cuts to an old school an um, um, analog answering machine on a table in an empty room, um, like a um, police, um, 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 what do you call it? Um, the word. In thank you, interrogation room. Um, so it's just an em um, um, empty room and the analog answering machine is in their um, interrogation room. Um, during the post-course, instead of having the women featured in the video mime the lyrics, the answering machine remains a nagging presence in, um, in the video, just as a chipmunk style post-course does in the song. But what endures as simultaneously beautiful and frustratingly hazy is whether the sped up vocals approximate the phone as such, the obsessive replaying of a digital voicemail, or the now former and presumed female love object. I say frustrating because despite all the different avenues for alternate imaginaries facilitated by this mechanized voice and calling um, um, my phone in general, um, for example, the song's verses could plausibly be interpreted as the two male performers addressing each other and not an imaginary ex-girlfriend. The overall um, vibe journeys down well-trodden and resolutely hit a cis heterosexist pathways, pathways in much the same way um, as Polo G's invocation of Siri. What frequencies would critically fabulating with and about the song through Ellison's black femme practice amplify? Would it facilitate interpreting the song's verses as the two male performers addressing each other um, and not their imaginary ex-girlfriend? Um, would this fabulation make possible to hear the feminized voice as purely machinic as a software plugin and not a human person? Um, in the end, I'm left with the question, is it still a homosocial triangle if the effectively charged and exchanged object appears seemingly technological, though undoubtedly feminized, rather than human? The lower frequencies of images might be comprehended as, quote, felt sound, as vibration, Tina Kemp. An 1893 illustration published in the British Journal, Folklore, a quarterly review of myth, tradition, institution, and custom, depicts a subject cantilevered 45 degrees off the vertical axis in repose, its arms akimbo, a tree trunk emerging from its flesh. The figure, part human, part plant, has a grin on its face. Its trunk spine extends from torso overhead to form a promenade of palm fronds extending down from its waist into the earth to root. Its posture leans almost towards the 180 degree, suspended parallel to the earth. The description on the broad side reads in all caps with an exclamation point, obey a worship in the East and West Indies. Intended to caution British readers, the image entangles the black enslaved and native ecologies of the archipelago as one species conspiring on a shared frequency of the unruly. Leaning operates as a mode of productive incivility. A refusal to lock into the natural alignment at the 90 degree for bodies marked as human, man, citizen, and subject. Obeya, referred to here as black magic, is said to be difficult to define, as it is believed by some to not be a single unified set of practices. 
Upon reviewing the archive of Obeya trials from the 17th century onward, I find a pattern. Enslaved women, three total, found in the bush past daylight, suspicion of Obeya. Enslaved man returns from the hills late at night, suspected of Obeya. Three enslaved men and one woman found together in the bush, suspected of Obeya. With little to no mention of magic, spells, herbs, or root work, the charge of Obeya allowed the landowning class to separate those suspected rehearsing a revolt. As real revolts proliferated across the Middle Passage, the juridical archive sees an increase of Obeya-related laws, calcifying untraceable blackness and the ecological surround as a collaborator in, as collaborators in the illegality of destabilizing empire. In 1968, Rainford Hugh Perry quits his apprenticeship with Clement Cox and Dodd at Studio One. The, record, the recording label Studio One is an integral musical scene in Kingston at the time for the sonic movements of rocksteady, reggae, and ska. The very public dispute between the up-and-coming producer and the famed record label founder is all on display in Perry's inaugural hit track, People Funny Boy under his new record label, Upsetter Records. People Funny Boy foreshadows Perry's innovative use of remix and studio effects to create new instrumental and vocal versions of existing reggae songs, with the addition of warped baby cries interspersed with recordings of Coxon's own voice on the track. Upsetter Records' success following the 1967 track Run For Cover and The Whaler's Mr. Brown inspired Perry to move the studio from its storefront location in Kingston to his backyard in order to have more control over the entire recording process. The Black Ark is built in 1973 as an additional structure on Perry's estate in the county of St. Andrew Parish, the first parish established under the British Crown, colloquially referred to as Liguinea, the Arawak name for the camouflaging iguana endemic to the region. At Black Ark, Perry reaches unheard limits in audio frequencies and recording techniques for dub music, which earn him the reputation of the mad scientist or the Obeya man. Mm -hmm. Artists like Susan Cadigan, Bob Marley, and the Whalers, Junior Biles, and the Congos grace the Ark along with pilgrimages of the Rastafari seeking to witness his magic at work. In a dream deferred, will the condemned Rastafari ever return to Africa, Sylvia Winter writes, the Rastafari religion, like many of the cults of the dispossessed Negro, is based on the concepts of a black god and a black Christ. It is a religion of protest. It recalls Buchmann's incantation to his followers on the eve of the Haitian Revolution, which still echo in their hearts. While the present rulers of Jamaica continue to be continue to plaster up sores without looking for the causes of the disease in the bloodstream, discontent will not only continue, but will spread its infection. From the early 20th century onward, bomb healers, revivalists, Garveyites, and people who later joined with Leonard Howell to form Rastafari were all po prosecuted for Obeya, even though many of them were resolutely hostile to Obeya themselves. The Jamaican middle and upper classes judged the desire for an African return, the amplified sound system cultures, ganja smoke, studies in communism, and syncretic spiritualisms as backwards. Yet Perry allowed the Rastafari at the Ark, as he himself was practicing a parasitic play within respectability politics of Jamaica. Perry appropriated the ongoing colonial anxieties of blackness's entanglement with ecologies and backwardness as fodder that inspired his unruly recording techniques and sonics that both infected the island through folklore of the Obeya Man and proliferated airwaves through upsetter records. Michael Veal details Perry's modes of trickery as a form of neo-African anti-rationality in regards to his recording techniques such as when Perry would run studio microphones from his console to nearby palm trees in order to record what he called the living African heartbeat. Or when Perry blessed, he would say, his recording equipment with invocations and spiritual powers through the burning of candles and incense, whose wax and dust remnants were freely allowed to infest his electronic equipment. Perry would al was also known to blow ganja smoke onto his tapes while recording, or to spray them with a variety of fluids, including whiskey, blood, and urine, to enhance their spiritual properties. 
Many of Upsetter Records musicians believed there was a direct correlation between the technical decay of Perry's recording facility and the unique sounds he was able to realize in dub. Susan Cadigan shares regarding her time recording with Perry at the Ark, I think highly skilled or highly talented people have ex some eccentric habits because he is strange. <laughs> he writes on everything and I ask him, why you write up the place? He said, well, if you don't write, you are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but the life of the art came with stress and unwanted outside influences of police, infiltrators, and Perry's own madness that began to take their toll. Eventually, the studio burned to the ground, which Perry has constantly insisted that he burned the black art himself in a fit of rage. Ending as it had begun, and as many of Perry's studios would come and go in a mercurial happening in an uncontrollable blaze. We situate the 808s as, many, um, as one of many enunciations of black studies as heavy waves and vibrations that intersect with and interrupt black life discursively and physiologically as heartbreak. Heartbreak captures at least a little those injuriously loving emulations of what it means to be black and human within the context of white supremacy. Heartbreak works with and in excess of the biomythological heart, the hollow muscular organ, and its narratives of effectively variegated tenderness and loss. Heartbreak represents the reverberating echoes of our collective plantrocratic historical pasts in the present. Heartbreak elucidates how the violence of racial capitalism inaccurately reproduces black life. Heartbreak bursts apart. Heartbreak is feeling outside of oneself. Heartbreak is the demand to feel outside of one's individuated self. Heartbreak cannot be recuperated. Heartbreak fails the heartbroken. Heartbreak waits. It sounds. It envelops us like the thumping bass of the TR-808. Heartbreak cannot be repaired or resisted. It emulates but defies emulation. Perhaps 808 soundtrack black studies and pride a technology or boom of blackness that organizes itself through heartbreak, actuating both heart muscles and a kind of ongoing hurtful tenderness ingrained in the flesh. With this, 808s provide oral glimpses and moments of heartbreak that cannot be forgotten. They are plain in sight harmfully and situate sexual violence as a terrain that demands a response that is not invested in prior injured states. Responses and alternatives to injury are awful and difficult and forever. They emerge as song, story, grooving, crying, fight, jumping, quietness, laughing, poem, burning down the black arc, mm -hmm. um, and more, always more. This is living, necessarily living, and finding our way through earlier modes of heartbreaking damage that comprise the mattering of black life, though not exclusively so. Where is the love? The story, the stories told above, cannot be told without the deep boom, clap, unspeakable yet audible heartbreak, like a shh, eviscerated ear-piercing silence. The flesh rescued the TR-808 drum machine from obsolescence. One way to understand black culture's relationship to technology is through the way that especially black music slash sound humanizes by enfleshing the supposedly discrete, abstract, rigid, and inhuman machines by making them usable in heretofore um, non-existent modalities. Whether this is the turntable, um, the player piano, or the 808. Take the way that Brandy intonates the 808 on this particular track that she recorded with Timbaland in 2011, which is called um, 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 808, but was never officially released. You hear me from a block away, I still got getaway. Baby, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? Baby, can you hear me now? Can you hear me um, now? Not one of the many internet lyric sites provides transcriptions of Brandy's rhythmic and harmonic ad-libs. Um, the way that she enunciates 808, 808, 808, sung in her unmistakably husky tone and reoccurring for the duration of the song. These sites only archive the alphabetic words. Clearly, this is not the science of the word as imagined by Sylvia Winter's elaboration of M.A. Césaire, but it does allow us to think about the mechanics of voice and how Brandy's 808, 808, 888 parallels and is purposed for non-linguistic purposes. 
The tone of Brandy's voice and her intonation are fundamental to how the song works, how it achieves its effects in the flesh. It is also fundamental to shifting the signification of the machine, the drum machine in this case, envisioning what the machine can and cannot do. Emulating the sensation of the TR-808, Brandy's vocal apparatus undertakes the care work of humanizing technology. This can be likened to, but does not twin to how modern mobile technologies become and are um, incorporated into humanness via their use in R&B music. Boom like an 808. Here too, we take black women's creative imagining of space, the beat intention of Brandy's 808, 08, 08, um, to undo the supposedly empty and or inhuman black geographies of sound. In this way, both spheres facilitate the imagining of the flesh or black life as cosmogony. High above this desert, I am becoming absorbed. Audre Lorde, Sahara. When we follow the frequencies of blackness in particulate life, it is unavoidable to surrender to the idea of past as past. The past becomes undeniably a position. As these pasts rage onwards into our present from their triumphal presence at the front line of the war and down to the material ecologies of the fine grain. The fine grain that rages in storms, who stir in the Saharan, eastern, and southern reaches of the African continent before taking flight. Migratory performances that loop once or twice around the globe are captured by satellite imaging as masses of brown flows that give form to the interstitial, to the choreographies of the air we breathe, the arcing patterns that resist the boundaries at the Strait of Gibraltar or between the US and the Southern Hemisphere the lives of sand and soil that now meld with that of ash from forest on fire, frequencies of the particulate, sand, topsoil, ash, the list continues, are unavoidable frequencies of the past as not past, blocking out the visibility of the sky, slowing our pace as its debris enter our lungs, settling its remains on the surfaces of our outdoors, on the sources from where we drink, on the soils to which we grow what we eat, becoming part of our molecular life in these shifting organic infrastructures. By 1976, Stevie Wonder had a four-time Grammy-winning Grammy album, Songs in the Key of Life. Taking a decidedly different trajectory in his next project, Stevie was commissioned in 1978 to score the film adaptation of the book, The Secret Life of Plants, by Peter Tompkins and Christopher Bird. The Secret Life of Plants is a, quote, pseudo-scientific botany guide describing the social-emotional lives of plants through polygraph tests. Wonder accepted the commission with great surprise as he shared, I'd always figured if I did one, it would be for a film that raised society's consciousness about black people. On the fourth track of Journey, to this Journey Through the Secret Life of Plants, entitled Same Old Story, Wonder bridges two themes, the secret life of plants and black people by drawing listeners' attention to the research of George Washington Carver, who from the late 1800s onwards encouraged black communities in the South to revitalize soil chemistry by using cover crops, rotating plants, legumes, mulch, and compost from the forest and wetlands to fortify the topsoil from generations of cotton monocropping. Carver's innovations helped regenerate the topsoil of these black geographies from their previous devastated plantation state and concomitantly feed these communities. When asked what was the source of these ideas, Carver said, I go into the forest every morning before the sun rises and I listen to the voices of nature, the unlimited broadcasting station, which sends the message every time if I just tune to the right frequency. Listening to the natural world has been foundational to the principles of Western music composition exemplified in bird songs like that of the California wren that instructed the octave or the hermit thrush that offered the pentatonic scale. It is the devotional act of listening between sonic life, the ecological, and black life that wonder and carver attune us. Journey into the secret life of plants hit number four in the first month before plummeting quickly as reviewers thought it too experimental with its extended instrumentals grand orchestral arrangements and highly processed, unintelligible vocals. Wonder's chorus to same old story still rings true. On we go to where who knows, to a place where there's still non-believers. 
What will it take for those who find what's real too hard to believe in? It's that same old story again. Vanessa Agar Joan takes us through the disobedience of sand and what the sands remember. We're black queer sociality in Martinique's story through gatherings that occur on beaches, out of sight from the state and potential harm, with afterlives that travel from these momentary queer geographies with party goers through the grains of sand. Agar Jones tells us, from the sand on the beaches of Saint Pierre to the morning after sand in Corinne's ass, sand is everywhere in Martinique, as it is throughout the region. It is of course on the beaches, but it is also carried on the wind and on their bodies. It ends up on the kitchen floor and in the back seat of the car, in the bottom of my handbag and in all manner of bodily orifices. Particles of sand that travel in their wares, embedding its fine grain into the seat and carpeting of cars in between the creases of bodies, indexes queer encounters as persistent. The persistence of these queer encounters as on clock continuities residing on lower frequencies as the party goers travel through the everyday regimes of publicness, negotiating what to withhold, what to inexpress. Nearly everywhere on earth, sand is principally made up of one element. In some places, silica, in others, limestone. 90% of a grain is almost always just one of these elements. But the other 10% is the percentage that makes a difference the percentage that, in its difference, matters, the percentage that can tell us something about the history of a place. Like in the beaches of Martinique, where the interval of labor and time required for getting to the black queer function takes commitment and perseverance, you must enter through the unruly ecologies, re-perform these maroon choreographies, leaving enough time to get lost. And it is the sand that keeps the score of the night until morning, the archive of laughter, of dancing, of cruising, of gossip, of new commitments, of breakups, modes of conviviality, of anti-fascist living that can only be possible in appositional thermodynamics on stolen time. Perhaps in the, own, perhaps in the ongoing life of the long emancipation yet realize we must be prepared to go elsewhere. Like the sand that storms, that travels in the creases of our flesh, to encounter each other, to assemble, to be with that motion of the fine grain on disordered terms that reside on otherwise frequencies. Thank you so much, Alex and Jonathan. Um, so we're gonna open it up to be able to talk for a bit. We're gonna keep this on the shorter side of things, maybe like three or four offerings, questions, um, so we can have some more just informal unfurling too. But um, so, and we don't have a mic to pass, but it's a small enough room, but so um, that's, those are the conditions. Um, but I thought maybe Well, you, you chose it. Um, I don't think that there was anything particularly deep about it. I just no. thought it would be interesting to do it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I, I think, you know, what I was hoping would happen happened. That, you know, um, it sort of allowed me to view what I was reading differently. Same. But also, you know, I could sort of see all the different points where we were in dialogue with each other without it sort of um, clearly um, 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 being. So for instance, there were two quotes or references to um, June Jordan in, um, in the parts that I read. I didn't, because I didn't want to, no. um, didn't say, didn't, didn't want to interrupt the flow. But yeah, I thought, um, yeah, that that would be just a little bit more um, interesting and dynamic than just having each of us read um, 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 for, for an, um, um, an, 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 an allotted um, um, time. And um, yeah, that, that was basically it.
I mean, I think clearly it's something different, and I don't really know how the um, 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 calling my phone how it was produced. There's not, you know, there are a lot of stories about mm -hmm. Lee, um, about the Black Ark and um, um, Lee Scratch Perry producing, and all of these um, um, different things. What I so I don't even know if this was part of the original track that you know mm -hmm. that was brought to or that they chose. Etc. Um, um, and um, so on. I was I was going to say um, I cut that off. That was brought to them perhaps by the record company or so, or um, um, their their producer. I don't really know. What I do know though, I think where the creativity comes in is how they navigate around it. That to me is kind of where the creativity comes in because I think that um, at least the way that I hear it that that sample really kind of sets the tone for the rest of the track, right? Um, it sets the tone for the rest of the track thematically, right? In the sense that, you know, they're both singing and rapping about um, 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 someone um, incessantly calling their phone. But I think it also sets the um, 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 tone um, musically um, so that there are, you know, all these different ways in, um, um, in, for, in, for instance, the little TJ moments, he makes this kind of cell phone sound in like two of his three verses, et cetera, and so on. So that there's clearly this dialogue going on that they're both having with this, um, 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 with this, you know, basically AI sample, right? Um, and, and, and I think I would kind of hear it in the, the longer tradition that I was talking about in the sense that black music oftentimes is, um, you know, it gets the job of humanizing these technologies, right? So that, you know, um, there's not really initially listening to it any way that one would think that this is not, you know, a kind of sped up human voice, right? Um, but nevertheless, you still have that and you have the interaction and, um, and it sounds really good, right? So I would say even though it's something different, that it's also doing interesting things with um, um, a different kind of um, 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 technology, right? Um, yeah, especially vocally. So, thank you for that. Is that time? Is it calling? There's a hand behind you. Um, well, the proposal began with Alex in terms of the seven-minute structure, but you know, Marguerite is also the missing outlier, in this, in who's the, the unspeaking person. Um, and I don't think I have a, f a fully fledged answer to that, but other than I think that the rubbing and friction and harmon harmonics of both the different kinds of offerings as well as Marguerite in the space um, feel like they also um, gesture to like a kind of rhythm, a cognitive rhythm that at least for me um, feel helpful towards the way of thinking about the writing practice, but also the way that the information needs to not be privileged through a kind of linear routing mm -hmm. um, and a kind of like um, autonomy of the kind, which I think you already disrupted that from the first invitation, but it kind of continues and that feels embedded inside of a kind of black feminist logic of, uh, well, a particular kind of legacy of black feminism that maybe is trying to really disrupt the kind of 
um, Kamal Brathwaite has this term that says the colonial pentameter mm -hmm. and to break with that colonial pentameter. And it makes me think about that kind of like, what is the syntax to which we speak um, and how it creates a kind of cognitive schema for how we think we know. So I th that is my response and I feel like that was a kind of attempt. It's interesting in terms of that whole like